we can see you. Hello. Uh, good, great. And and uh, can you hear okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we yes. can hear great. And and how, how's yeah. sort of the audio quality? It's good. It's great. All right. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Well, welcome, Moss. Thanks for thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, th thanks for having me. Nice to be here. All right. Great. Well, thanks. how the how this is going to go is um, we're just going to kind of check it. Did you get a chance to listen to an episode? Uh, no, I didn't. I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's that's fine. It's nothing complicated. Just a little setup. This is how it goes. We just kind of check in with each other. And then we'll segue into you, uh, you know, welcome, you know, welcome aboard and that kind of stuff. And then um, we'll ask you some questions, get a little background, you know, how you got started working on ships and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then we'll go into your ship story. You know, we'll say something like, well, let's, let's, let's hear the story because, you know, it's going to be a, <laughs> a good one. And, uh, and then just, we'll just have you say, and if you forget, uh, we'll, we'll remind you, but at, at some point we're going to, we're going to have you say my name's now, is it Moss Hills? Yes. So, okay. Uh, Moss Hills. Okay. Hills. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cause your email address confused me cause it's Moss Hill. And I'm like, Oh wait, did no, I no, no, my email okay. address is Moss Hills with an S. Oh, okay. 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 Sorry. Sorry. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. It's another episode of My Ship Story Podcast, and we got a good one for you today. But before that, let's check in with the guys, see what's going on. Scott, what's happening? Uh, you know, this is, the, this is the quiet before the storm. Next week, my whole world goes completely batshit. So uh, next week, the entire week, I'm completely slammed with this whole play thing that I am in. Uh, cause you know, I don't know if I told you, um, I, I was excited to do that and have lines in something for, for a change. I didn't expect to have 25 pages of dialogue to remember. <laughs> so wait, that's wait, and me... it's a live play. Well, it's a live play, but there's no, um, there's no audience because of COVID and stuff, but they're filming it. So, okay. um, it, it'll go good. Cause you know, the people are going to have to do a lot of editing, I'm, I'm not <laughs> editing, but they're going to have to edit a lot of me. And so we practice Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We film it on uh, uh, the 15th through the 18th. And then the 19th, I'm in the world championship barbecue. Uh, and then the 20th, uh, no, the next day I'm in uh, another deal that I haven't even looked at my lines yet. That's only like two or three sentences. And then the next the day after that, I'm in the finalist or, uh, for judging the, the barbecue. Wow. And, and like I said early, uh, earlier, you know, I have to be an English detective. So I'll be listening to everyone, <laughs> everyone English uh, and studying because uh, wow. I have a problem on, you know, I'll talk English and everything will be all right. And then, and then I'll go down to Australia and I can't get out of Australia. <laughs> so, <laughs> And people I are think like, the, Scott, funny. you need to choose a particular English accent. Yeah, because I was going to say, very are you... different depending where you are. So pick one yeah. and try yeah. to do that rather than trying to piece together different people from our show that are from like Liverpool and like uh, from their North England. And yeah. they have like, yeah, these you're, different you're sounding English really posh. Accents. You got yeah. a really posh well, I'm, accent. I'm trying right not now. to sound too too much like Sherlock Holmes or you know like <laughs> because I'm like, hey, he's a detective, and so I apologize, Moss, uh, for, <laughs> for the slaughtering of the of the English stuff. So yeah, I mean, um, so, I'm, yeah. I'm from Zimbabwe actually. So oh wow. Oh, wow. Um. So yeah, that's all. What's going on, with me? And uh, let's go over to Eric. I don't have much. I'm still dealing with dogs, dogs, dogs. I think one, my other dog is going over while he sleeps in his crate. She goes over and pees on the, the edge of the crate to try to blame it and see if he gets the blame for it. Uh, because there's no way he can pee that much outside the crate. And I just think she's going over there in, in the middle of the night and, and peeing on him and all the crates. So yeah, the fun struggles of getting all the dogs on the same schedule 
It's crazy. Has the housing market the slowed down any at all? No. I mean, it's been slowing down a little bit, like a tiny bit, but it's very local. So it, it really depends on the neighborhood and what's going on there. But there's so few homes for sale still that it's it's a struggle. Like I'm still trying to find houses for clients. Um, and uh, hopefully I got another princess person moving out to, to the Nashville area. <laughs> so little by little, I'm just encouraging more uh, ex princess folk to to move over to the area. Cool. Well, it sounds like it sounds like things are going very well for you guys right now. But let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, you ever been on a ship that sank? <laughs> no, no, that's that's the worst nightmare. No, that's that. No, absolutely not. And and for everybody out there that really hasn't worked on ships, uh, the the sinking of a cruise ship is very rare. <laughs> I mean, it happens, but not very often. Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's, you know, we've mentioned a, a, a fire or two, but um, the, the sh a ship actually going down is a pretty rare occurrence. And on our show today, we have a guest that was on a ship that sank. So pretty exciting. So welcome to the show, Moss Hills. Thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks very much for, for having me. It's uh, fun to be here. Well, so, um, this is going to be this is going to be a great short. But before we get started, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get started on ships? When did you join? Um, you know, how did it all happen? Because uh, you know, back in the day, it was wasn't wasn't as common as it is now. No, I mean, I'm I'm born and raised in that great seafaring nation of Zimbabwe. <laughs> 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 so. I mean, who thought that I would end up being being on ships? But um, but I'm a I'm a mu musician, a drummer, and I kind of left Zimbabwe and headed down to South Africa. That was the, the the big lights of South Africa and Johannesburg to try and become a professional drummer. I did, and I did that when I was 20, and then I thought of playing other instruments and doing different things. And then I met and married my wife Tracy in South Africa, and we were working together. Uh, as a duo and then we joined with my brother as a trio and started working on ships and we did our first ship a ship called the Aster which uh, sailed out of Cape Town we were heading up to to Southampton and back and stops along the way of course and in fact that first voyage um, was the worst storm I've ever had in all my many 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 years of, uh, of cruising we didn't sink or anything but we were in a force 12 hurricane off the Bay of Biscay oh, for, for 36 hours it was oh, that awful. does not sound. And like that fun. didn't put me off, and so that was my first ship. So, and, and just, what year? What what year was that? Uh, so that must have been about nineteen eighty eight, something like that, eighty nine maybe. Wow. So yeah. a long time ago. But then that, as we all know, the, the sort of the cruise bug bites, and it's it's not just the travel bug. It, it's it's the cruise bug. There's just something about walking on board a ship that just it's, there's a feeling and it's and 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 so we just continued to work on ships and worked as musicians and entertainers and then I became a cruise director which is what I'm doing now and uh and and I still love it oh wow so, so you're, you're still, still working, working on ships yeah oh wow. wow wow who are you working for silver sea oh yeah Bosch. Wow. Yeah. yeah 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 I mean and I, I've, I've worked on every type of ship from real real old rust buckets right up to now, what, what I, I feel is the absolute pinnacle of my whole cruising career. I mean, Silver Sea and, and the ships are so gorgeous. And, and, and it's, I've worked on big ships, but I, I, and I, and I love them, I love any kind of ship, but I like this smaller ship, the kind of intimacy and, and the fact that you get to know everybody on board and it's a, oh, I love it still, really do. You know, you, you, you touched on something there a second ago, and, and it's really interesting because, you know, you, us and, and our friends and, and stuff that's worked into the, into the cruise industry, you know, you, you get bit by the travel bug and you want to travel and, and all that stuff, but it really is a separate issue. Like you said, it's the, it's the cruise bug. And yeah. that, that's pretty interesting that you say that because yeah, you get, you get used to cruise life with cruise ships and your cruise family, that it's kind of a different thing. You know, people are like, Oh, well, you got a travel bug. Well, yeah, I like to travel, but I think, like you said, I think we all got a cruise bug and that's why we were on for so long. 
Yeah. Hey, yeah, exactly. hey, don't don't we know somebody? Didn't haven't we had a guest on that the work for Silver Seas? Do you remember? Um, I think we have somebody that passed through Silver Seas. Maybe. Oh, okay. Did did Derek work for Silver Seas? Oh no, he worked for Crystal. Yeah. Um, does Does Sue Richardson work for Silver Seas? I don't know. Don't know. I don't okay. Know. I've, I've, I've know. heard. I've know. heard Silver Seas passing in one of our previous um, episodes. Okay. But, no. Ne- yeah. Never mind. Never mind. Cut, right, cut this part out. Let's get. Let's get off of that. <laughs> our lack of memory. Cut <laughs> <Yeah>. it out. <laughs> I haven't taken my, my, my geek of Loba. Yeah. So um, specifically, Moss. So how did you get that first gig on a ship? Did you was it just a musician gig that came up and 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 you started, or was it something you specifically that you want to do? It's like, oh ships, let's let's give that a shot. Well, the the, the way that I, we started working on ships the first time is we were doing a gig in a in a in a harbor town, a port town in South Africa, in Port Elizabeth. And uh, we weren't really wild about the gig and We'd gone down to the harbor and were strolling around and looking at ships. And there, there was a cruise ship, and we were looking at it and thinking, "Wow, you know, that would just be fantastic. We should, we should try and work on a ship one day. I mean, wouldn't that just be amazing?" And I, I've spent my youth messing about in in sailboats, yachts, and my dad and I built a couple of them, and we would race yachts and I, and, and just being on the water. And I loved all of that. So perhaps that had some bearing on it. But then we spoke to our agent and said, look, if a ship gig comes up, let us know. And he said, okay, fine. And a few months later, he said, look, there's something. There's the Asta. Do you want to give it a go? And we said, oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, I, I really want to get to this, this story because this is something that I have been wanting to do since the very early days, ever since Eric mentioned this on his, uh, on his podcast, on his origin story. He mentioned that uh, the week that he joined was the week that the, that the Oceanic Anis, Oceanus, I'm going to have to get that. That's hard to say. Um, <laughs> it sank and so um so ever since he mentioned that i have been on the hunt for you <laughs> <laughs> so you the english detective to come and track me down <laughs> well i i just was uh just fishing 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 and finally finally somebody was like hey if you want this story moss hills is the person to go to and then that's that's when i tracked you down and and got you on i will stalk you people if i want you <laughs> i will stalk you don't make me stalk you down get on here <laughs> so anyway moss uh let's let's get into this story and if you can remember say you know yeah my name's moss hills and this is my ship story right well um, my name is moss hills and this is my ship story i've been working on cruise ships for many many years my wife and i as entertainers and we were booked on a ship called the Oceanus, which was a, a Greek cruise ship owned by Peritiki Lines and sailing out of Piraeus, the port of Athens, that was the home port. And the ship was chartered by a South African company and we were booked on as the musicians. It was an eight month contract and we would sail up and down the south african coast between cape town and durban stopping at different ports and we'd also go durban to the indian ocean islands have done many of those up to madagascar and mauritius and then further north to seychelles and that's the kind of itineraries we were used to doing wow and so on this particular voyage we'd sailed from cape town to east london was a stop and then we were going from east london on to durban and it was a little bit unusual because when we got to East London, all of the guests disembarked and the ship was chartered by a, a businessman in East London for his daughter's wedding. So oh, wow. all of the guests disembarked. They were sent to a big hotel resort. We went and had the wedding and the wedding, the weather was really, really rough. And we were in East London Harbour, embarked all the wedding guests. And... It, it was a bit comedic, really, because it, the ship was rolling around such a lot, and you'd see the wedding guests kind of rolling from side to side like this. It, it was it was awful, but we did the wedding, came back into the harbour so it could be a bit calmer, and then they had a party right through the night until the dawn, and so 
my wife Tracy and I as entertainers, we were performing plus another band and then two magicians and we'd alternate 45 minutes on, then a magician for 15 minutes back to a band for 45 right through the night. Then they all disembarked the next morning and the guests came back and we were going to head out to sail to Durban. And the storm was just getting worse and worse and worse. And we were exhausted anyway after having such a long night. But, you know, guests embark and I didn't feel it was unsafe to sail. So much for the rules regarding a uh, number of hours you work in a day. <laughs> Especially <laughs> well, back then. I, mean, I think that's one of the things with, with uh, cruise ship work, you realize that yeah. kind of the rules about how many hours you work kind of go out the window. There are rules, but it's just one of the, and this is a long time ago. This was 1991. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and I, I wasn't hassled, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a just, I just want to get in there type of guy. So I didn't mind about the extra work. And so it was time to sail. Heck of a strong wind, a really, really strong wind. And as we sailed out of East London Harbour, heading out into the storm, I didn't feel it was unsafe, but I knew it was going to be a rough night. And always as we sail out of the port for the first time, we'd normally have a sail away party. And Tracy and I would play on the deck and all the guests would be there and it'd be great fun and we'd sing in songs and it's a great start. But that didn't happen this time. We went into the lounge, the Four Seasons Lounge and performed there. And it was, people came, it was great fun, but it was not many people. Most had gone straight to their cabins and were feeling quite ill. And the storm just got worse and worse and worse. And then as night fell, it came time around for dinner. Tracy and I were in the restaurant and we've got a little, very small restaurant just off the main restaurant where the entertainment staff eat. It was in this small restaurant. And we could hear in the main restaurant some of the waiters dropping trays and people sort of, oh, oh, you know, and, and, and sort of quite, quite sort of merriment in a way of things falling around. But it started to get worse and worse quite quickly. And people started sounding a little bit scared. And... Tracy and do, I thought. Do you know what? Perhaps, do you know what size swells you're dealing with here now? Are we? Because this sounds like thirty or forty foot swell. Yeah, that, they were that sort of size. And how I big mean, was the that, Oceanics? It's not a very large ship. I forget its weight now. I, I think it's about. It's a small, small, small ship. I think it was about fifteen, eighteen thousand tons, something like that. So very okay. small. Um, and. So when we, we just said to each other, we don't think we're going to be able to perform tonight because I don't know if I can stand on the stage with the guitar. With the guitar. I also play saxophone and other instruments and stuff. And so I don't know how easy it's going to be to stand with a guitar and a mic and, and, and keep upright. So I said to Tracy, I'm going to go upstairs, go and check in the lounge and see if, if the equipment's okay. I went up to the Four Seasons Lounge and stuff really was falling around him. I could see pot plants had fallen over and wow. on the stage, the cymbals on the drum kit, on the cymbal stands had fallen over. Some mic stands had fallen over. And I was concerned that the piano was going to actually slide off the stage, although it's got, it's not bolted down, but it's got like little special feet that it sits on so it can't roll. But it was starting to move towards the edge of the stage. Ooh. And whilst I was up there, and Tracy went down to the cabin, and whilst I was up there, it just got worse and worse and worse. And people started coming out of the restaurant and just entering the lounge. They would come up the staircase out of the restaurant and the, kind of the natural gathering place was in the lounge. And it started to fill up a lot. And then suddenly, boom, all the lights went out. Oh, Jesus. And that's a bit scary. That's so not we a had good sign. And, no, we had and this was it was light. dark right like it was in yeah. the late oh, evening man. yeah th this was probably around about somewhere between about 8 p.m and 9 p.m something like that oh, and, so and let me tell you let me tell you people when when the when the power goes out on the ship it is pitch black on the interior of the ship i mean pitch black yeah yeah absolutely right it is and so when the power went off we got the emergency lights come on with these little tiny lights sort of at floor level to show you where to walk and a couple of overhead lights. So we had very, very dim lighting come on, but it's, it's really quite disconcerting to, to suddenly be in the darkness like that. And people were still streaming into the lounge and, and, and some of the entertainers were there with me and 
so we decided to try and just sing a little bit to to kind of keep them entertained and i was just waiting for the lights to come on so i, I like I visioning interesting... I, I like it when you say stuff like that i'm like thinking of the titanic and musicians <laughs> playing you know, <laughs> play faster, play faster. <laughs> yeah yeah oh my god go ahead sorry and um so we didn't have any power so i couldn't use microphones or anything like that but i had an acoustic and i started singing a few just fun sing-along type songs and a couple of the other entertainers were helping out with that and you know getting a bit of merriment from people but every sort of few minutes you know when i'm in between songs they'd say moss what what's happening what where are the lights and i had no idea and i kept on saying things oh well, you know, we didn't pay the electricity bill and the lights will come on soon and this sort of thing but people were getting stressed and i was waiting for an officer dressed in white to come striding into the lounge and say something or for there to be an announcement over the pa system i mean that's what you would expect to happen if they but just nothing happened no announcements no offers just nothing happened and tracy then came into the lounge as well and she said that she'd seen the one of the senior officers who had a cabin near ours very near us she said she saw him come running down the passageway she was standing in the door by her cabin and we all know, you know it's quite narrow corridors and you, you kind of know each other but he completely ignored her and she was saying no, what, what's happening he just ignored her he looked a bit wild-eyed he looked wet and she was thinking my word what's happening and so tracy had packed a few kind of emergency things i've got an incredibly organized wife tracy's amazing <laughs> with stuff like that and anyway she came up to the lounge and she said to to me and the other entertainers who were there, this is what she had just seen. And we were thinking, yeah, there's something going on here. So, and I, I left the lounge and I said, look, I'm gonna go and try and find out what's going on. We need to see what is happening. Why is there no power? And now the, the ship, we could hear that the engines weren't running anymore. And so the ship not only was slowing down, but the trouble is, as I'm sure everyone knows, when you've got no power, you've got no way to steer the ship. So it just right, slowed right. down and then it just turned broadside onto the waves. Oh, and we were just oh. getting pounded unbelievably. And it was, it was dangerous to walk around. People, I was telling people, you know, sit on the floor, sit down. You know, so, and everybody was just sitting on the floor or on a chair if it was a fixed down chair. But we could also see that the ship was gradually just starting to heel over more and more to the starboard side. And we could see everything, you know, pot plants and chairs and anything that wasn't fixed down was starting to crash against the starboard side of that lounge. And while all of this is going on, no set, no voice from above, like no, no, uh, no warning, no announcement, no captain, no on the bullhorn. Everybody's no, so you're and, just on your own. No. So and, exactly. And so. While all this was going on, no announcements, absolutely nothing, no officer present, just nobody was there. And so I, I said, I'm going to go and try and find out what's happening. And Tracy was quite concerned about me doing that on my own. So I went and got one of the other entertainers, one of the um, magicians, Julian, and he came with me. And I, I, I always take my camera and, and video camera with me. And in those days, you know, a big old camera, you know, on my shoulder, you know, not like <laughs> a quick mobile phone you pull out of the, your pocket and uh, went down the cruise stairway. And I thought, well, I'm just going to go down as low as I can do and, and see what's happening and, and did some filming around. And Julie and I went all the way down to the crew only areas. And then, then we, we could hear crew sort of shouting and, and just this general uh, confused chaotic noise of, of and there's different nationalities and and we and we saw them we came on the staircase and nobody was taking any interest in us we could see them getting little um backpacks and small suitcases and everyone just seemed to be in a bit of a panic and we thought there's something serious going on we went even further down and i'd never been that low in the ship before I me mean, you know just staff you're not generally allowed to go into the engine room in that sort of area but we thought let's go down to the engine room and see if we can see any water or is there a fire or what's going on and we went all the way down and we couldn't see anything but the engine room was abandoned there was nobody in there it's incredibly dark very hard to see our way around the engine and room was 
everybody was gone from the engine room? Yeah, there's no one there. Wow. Oh, wow. That would wow. like seriously freak me out. Yeah. And we could see um what I don't even know. I don't even know if I would have the balls to go further down with that happening. <laughs> like yeah, I'm I sure mean, it, it would get darker and darker and darker. And yeah, it it was very scary, and, and we felt so uncomfortable. We knew we were way below the waterline, but we had to find out what was happening. We had a lounge packed full of people who were kind of saying, "Moss, what's happening?" And uh, we, we we needed to get answers, and and there were there was just nothing from any officers. So. We couldn't see that we were sinking, but we saw the watertight doors closed. But, you know, when you're at sea and in the engine room, those sort of watertight doors are normally closed in the normal course of traveling anyway. But we thought, okay, fine. We went back upstairs. And I had seen, I then, I then went to go and try and find the captain. I found the captain and the cruise director. And they were talking. And I remember asking the captain, Captain, you know what, what's happening? We've got no power and I've got this lounge full of people. And and I hadn't interacted with him before. And but he said, No, well, if, what we're going to do is we're going to abandon the ship. And I said, Well, why? Are, are we sinking or is there a fire? No, we're not sinking. There's no fire. Just going to abandon the ship as a precaution. And you know, I'm I'm the guitarist. He's the captain. You don't really <laughs> argue. But you know, now I, I, I'm a cruise director. I deal with the captain every day. I'm on the bridge all the time. But I mean, then that just wasn't the case. But I still questioned him. I said, "But, but captain, why do we have to get off the ship if we, if there's no fire and we're not sinking? I, it's a terrible storm in the middle of the night. I'm really scared to get into a lifeboat, and so will all our guests be scared. Why do we have to do it?" He said, "It's just a precaution." Let's just wait. On doesn't the ship. make doesn't make sense. You don't no. you don't get into the lifeboats as a precaution. No, no. And that's, that's you your really last. That's your last right. resort. But yeah, a ship without power in seas that rough. You, I mean, you, you know now that's going to go. It's this gonna whole go thing down. is making me nauseous. I'm sweating <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um. So, I thought. Right, okay, fine. I went back into the lounge. And I said, look, the captain said we have to start abandoning the ship. I didn't say this to the guests, but to Tracy and the other entertainers who were there. But we better start getting things organized. And Lorraine, who was the cruise director, she's a real go-getter. Um, very, very, you know, bang on, powerful woman. And she kind of got everybody motivated, all of us entertainment crew, to, to get going and, and right, start, start evacuating guests. So we, we just kind of took on our own responsibilities. I mean, we didn't have any official duties in something like that. Our official duties were really to listen to the announcements over the PA system. And if, if they, which we do in all the drills all the time, and you stand by a door and saying, uh, are you starboard side or port side? Over that way, over this way, you know, smiling nicely and trying to look serious all the time and just thinking, oh, not another drill. But there was, there was nobody organizing anything. So yeah, we went out and some of the um, crew were out there, had gone to their lifeboat stations, but there was nobody to, to give the order you know, to, to launch the lifeboats. And there was all the chaos around that. And so eventually they lowered the lifeboats to the lifeboat embarkation deck. But um, it's very dark. As I said, there are the emergency lights, but it's still very dark. And there's just the ships rolling around. There's spray everywhere. And about about what time was had, this now? So like from eight to like, is this like probably ten o'clock or eleven o'clock or? Th yeah, this is probably somewhere around ten, eleven o'clock. I'm so vague with the timeline, um, but I it, it it was getting later at night now. And so the lifeboats got lowered down, but when they are lowered, if when you do it all the time in drills, the ship is sitting nice and level fore and aft and, and, <laughs> and port to starboard. And they lower the lifeboat and you attach it to the side of the ship and then people embark it. But these weren't attached to the side of the ship. Nobody knew how to do it because there was nobody properly in charge. But the ship wasn't level like we normally do the drill. It was tilting over onto its starboard side and rolling. So the lifeboat would swing out 
and crash against the side of the ship. It was doing that all the time. And just so it would swing out and there's just a big gap dropping down into the ocean. Oh, oh, oh. And so it it was scary. And and guests didn't even want to get onto the lifeboat. So the only way that we could do it was was, was there were railings there. Um, I'm not quite sure how you're supposed to get them off, but again, myself and, and one of the entertainers, we've managed to get see these hinges had pins and we pulled the pins out. We just took the whole railing, didn't know what to do with it. We just threw it over the side of the ship. <laughs> um, so now we had this big open space, but it's supposed to have a lifeboat fitted to it. But as I say, the lifeboat would swing away and crash on. And what we did was we started creating a line of people coming in there. We did 20 at a time. So Tracy and some of the other entertainers were helping manage that side of things whilst I stood at the lifeboat. And when the lifeboat swung and, and hit the ship, <clears throat> I would then stand with sort of one leg on the on the ship and one leg on the lifeboat and try and get maybe two or three people onto the lifeboat. Oh, As I wow. felt the ship lurch the other way, I'd jump back onto the Oceanus. The lifeboat would swing out, crash against the side again, and oh, I'd try and do a few more. Don't, and, don't do that. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's it's you awful know, there's no for, choice for our guests to have to, to, to. I mean, it's scary enough abandoning the ship, but in that, you know, if they get it wrong, they'll just drop down the gap into the ocean or get hit by the lifeboat right. as it swings in. But the problem we had then, as we were filling the lifeboat, the more people they got in, the heavier it became. And when it swung out and hit the side of the ship, harder. the harder and harder it was hitting the ship until people in the lifeboat were very distressed they were kind of squealing in terror every time it hit the side of the ship oh my god and bits of the lifeboat were now starting to crack and break off and it was horrible horrible oh and my god. so then the the crew who were assigned to to kind of launch the lifeboats once it was we had a fair number of people in it we just decided listen let's just launch it and you know pull the levers and you don't need power to launch them they're all gravity fed as they go down and we would just launch the lifeboat. Nobody properly in charge of it. Nobody knew how to start the lifeboat engines because there was nobody in charge. Oh my God. And not what? all those lifeboats had engines in here. We had a couple of open lifeboats with, with you know, no roof over them and they don't have an engine anywhere. They have what's called a Fleming gear. And it's, it's, it's almost like, a, like an oar, a, a number of sort of oars where you sit and, and you pump the oars and it doesn't go over the side, but it goes down to, through a gear mechanism and drives a shaft in the bottom of the lifeboat and drives a propeller. It's a Fleming gear. And people are pumping those things like mad, but the lifeboat's going nowhere. We only found out subsequently because the Fleming gear was broken. It didn't work properly, but. (laughs) Um, And and these poor people just got launched into this thing, into the dark, and they just drifted away into the night. Oh my gosh. But so now what happened, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later, but to my mind, it's like, Okay, every crew member has an assignment, and you know there are people that are assigned to driving lifeboats. Um, what happened to these crew? Where where were they? Well, the 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 problem we had, and the reason there were no n- not the correct assigned crew to these positions, is right. because there's supposed to be some officers controlling all of this. Yeah, but we didn't know at the time. We I only know subsequently because there was a full inquiry into the whole sinking and. I was one of the people um, chosen to give evidence at the inquiry. And the the officers had abandoned the ship and got off in their own lifeboat. Oh, wow. And, Before and you? They had already everybody. left. Yeah, they, they, they'd already left. They left before anybody got off. That's not, not how it's supposed them, to go. No. But no, no. But, but most of the captain's most of the supposed to go down with the ship. Yeah, wow. had, had already left. And um most of the there was a huge amount of press coverage about the sinking afterwards and there still continues to be quite a lot of interest and there's a lot of tv documentaries and things and most of them always say that the captain got off in the first lifeboat but he actually didn't and he was still on board but i didn't know where he was and we just assumed he's on the bridge just doing what he can to kind of control the situation and we assumed there were no announcements because the the pa system maybe had failed I mean, we just, I didn't question that. I just thought, okay, well, the captain and whoever needs to be is on the bridge doing things. There's nobody here doing the lifeboats. So, so we just pitched in, just the entertainment team. Did, we were just doing the best we could do. So continued to launch those lifeboats, got them down. 
And now we'd finished the starboard side lifeboat, so we went to go and do the port side. Now the port side, we had now the opposite problem to the starboard side, because now the ship is still tilting right over to the starboard side, but now we're over on the port side, the lifeboats, when you lower them, are pressing hard against the ship and gravity won't pull them down. They're just sitting there. And so it seemed quite easy, although it was a, a bad angle, we got them loaded up and then the guys pull the levers, release the cables, the lifeboat just sits there. And as there's a big swell goes back the other way, the weight down a little bit goes, further. and part of the lifeboat suddenly drops, you know, a, a, a meter or two. And that's terrifying for people inside it. And then yeah. the, the front of the lifeboat goes down. And they need to tip out. And then the back. And eventually, bang, 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 bang into the water. The thing. Oh God. And, and I was really concerned that we were going to kill people putting them into those lifeboats on the port side. It was just too dangerous to, to put anybody else off there. So what we did so, then It's was, so funny when... when uh, uh, when, you know, English or like, you know, like you're saying, like, I was so concerned that this was happening. I would be freaking mm -hmm. the freak out, flipping. I don't know anybody that wouldn't be freaking out. I mean, granted, we all had lifeboats and this was in the 90s and we had, you know, positions on life raft, lifeboats, you know, all this kind of stuff. I would be flipping out. Well, you know, in, inside you are, but... It, it, it was it was a remarkable situation because I don't know really how we kind of ended up being in, in in charge of things, but there was nobody else, and and you and you could either be standing in a line hoping someone's going to rescue you, or you can start making it happen, and and and, and we couldn't just abandon the passengers. And also for, for us entertainers who'd been in the lounge, everyone was looking to us, and we were kind of entertaining them, and they were saying what's happening, and it was just this this kind of incremental um, assumption of responsibility that we just started to take on. And, and the next thing we were running it. And so the, the remaining lifeboats on the port side, we thought we'd only just leave the lifeboats there. So we launched them empty and left a painter in you know, a rope tied around the railing. So the lifeboat would stay with the ship. And we thought, well, fine, uh, when the ship goes down, we'll just try and untie it from the ship. And at least we've got a lifeboat floating right there. We all had life jackets on. We had a bit of a plan B and thought, well, you know, we've got lots of spare life jackets and they were in all sorts of lockers all around the pool deck areas. We'll get all the spare life jackets, tie them all together and make one huge, great kind of orange raft we can all kind of cling onto and hopefully we can make it to the lifeboats with sort of a, a vague plan B. But once we'd launched those port side lifeboats, we thought, right, Let's go to the bridge and ask the captain, you know, what, what can we do next? And at this stage, we had about, a, well, we knew we had a little over 200 people still on board. Actually, it was 228, I now know, afterwards. We, we had 571 people in total. And at this stage, there were 228 left. And so we, we went up to the, to the bridge, you know, with L Lorraine, uh, cruised it, and, the, and some of the entertainment team, myself and Tracy and a couple of the other entertainers, when up there. Uh, let me let me ask you this uh, when you're saying this like you let all you helped all these people over and your feet are splitting the the ship and the lifeboats and send them down all this happens what where in your mind did you think i really should jump in and go with that lifeboat to get away from this thing no nope, i gotta go back on and help you know i gotta well, continue it, my job it, it just didn't occur to me to 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 get off in those lifeboats because I knew there were still so many people on board. It just, you know, I, my focus became let, let's let's get everybody off. I mean, we just we just have to we just have to get everybody off. It's it just so it never occurred to me to think well okay I'll jump off now and or no I better not or it just didn't occur to me. It, we, we had this focus let's get everybody off and that that was what the focus was. And I think and, a lot and, of crew I think a lot of crew have that mentality right that you you're there to help and unless you see the ship is like already you know just about to sink you're gonna stay on as long as you can to make sure that you help everybody if you think about when we worked okay we never in, in a situation that stressful but there was always things that were happening that were causing problems that you know everybody jumped in together and worked to resolve the problem this is just at a, at a much much more serious uh level there 
Yeah. Uh, while while yeah. all this was going on, did you lose touch with your wife, uh, your wife Tracy, at any time, or was were you guys together at this time? Um, she was most mostly still in the lounge and keeping people calm and directing them out to those of us that were, that were doing the lifeboats. And a couple of times I'd go back in and, and see her and obviously really concerning for her, worried about me and me worried about her. Um, but then when we decided to go up to the bridge, we go up there and right, get there. And, you know, you're always a bit kind of respectful on, 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 on the bridge and you're quiet and go in there and looking around and couldn't see the captain. And the, the bridge was at night, it's always dark anyway, and you can just see the, the radars going and various lights on the control panels, but everything else is dark. And we were saying, hello, Captain, hello, and looking around and we could still see binoculars on the floor and charts and various other bits of debris on the floor. And we were calling out and then we realized there was nobody on the bridge. And, and it, that, that's really a bit of a shocking realization because it's the one area on the ship, there's always somebody there 24 hours a day. It's not always the captain, but certainly in a situation like this, it would be. And, and there's nobody on the bridge, nobody. Oh my God, that's, that's like, to me, that's like the worst thing you could see. Like if I'm thinking of a horror movie <laughs> and that's the worst thing, walking onto the, the, the and realizing, oh crap, nobody's driving this thing. Nobody's, mm. nobody's in charge. Oh my was, God. Was there any, was there any panic that set in at that point or what was there so much panic around already it was just another another thing that was going wrong yeah i mean it, it, there wasn't any panic amongst us it was just like okay so the bridge is abandoned you know i don't know where these people are but okay well what, what's next and for us the main thing was now we knew we still had over 200 people on board how do we get everybody off now we need to make communication somehow. Had no idea how to use the radios, but figured, well, you know, the radios must be working uh, because all those stuff is on backup power systems. So Lorraine and myself uh, and Julian and Robin, one of the other magicians, we all took turns and, and you know, trying to call Mayday and, and eventually managed to make contact with um, another ship. And finally got but that ship was too far away they didn't know where we were and and, and in fact there was, a, there was a the whole thing was a, was very weird because one of the one of the times when i was on the radio and calling and and spoke to captain detmar was the this captain on the radio who'd answered me he had, he had this this big deep very um calming voice and just the kind of voice you need to hear that that and, and we thought great okay and he was on a ship called the Ned Lloyd Mauritius was the name of his ship. And he was saying, okay, you know, what, what is your murder at this big voice? Uh, We're going and, down! Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and we said, look, we're, we're on the cruise ship Oceanus. We're sinking. Okay. He kept on saying, okay. We got, okay. So how, how much longer have you got left to float sort of thing? And I was saying, well, we, we don't know. We, we, we could sink in, in an hour. It could sink in five hours. We just don't know. The starboard railings are dipping into the water all the time. And we're very heavily lifted over to starboard. And our concern at that point, we said the ship might just flip right over. Yeah, and that's so pretty far. Sort of, yeah. Oh. So he was saying, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> and then he says, so um, what, what is your position? So I said, uh, <laughs> well, we're, we're about halfway between the port of East London and Durban. We're heading to Durban. And he said, no, 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 no. What are your coordinates? So I said, I don't know what the coordinates are. And he was, what rank are you? Uh, I said, well, I'm, yeah, I'm not a rank. I'm, I'm a guitarist. Okay. And he was, well, what are you doing on the bridge? I said, well, you know, there's nobody else here. There's, there's just me you know my wife the bass player and and there's julian the magician and robin and the rain oh <laughs> and, and he must have and he was saying well, what are you doing on the bridge where's, where's the captain we speak to the captain now well he's not here well who's on the bridge and it's just the entertainers yeah but he oh was so good he was okay um 
And he said, well, we'll, we'll, we need to try and work out what your position is. And a bit of a long story, how we tried to suss that out. And, and, and we, could, we could see another ship in the distance, actually. And it's night, so we could see the lights from that ship. It must have been quite a small ship, not much light. And of course, we had no lights, but we still had our little emergency light on, lights on. Um, but we said, we could see another ship, but it doesn't know we're in distress and it probably can't see us. These great waves everywhere. It's not even looking for us. But if we said to Captain Detmore, you know, if he can get hold of the South African authorities in Durban, they can radio every ship that's in this part of the coast and instruct them to go onto their bridge wing and, and look for a ship in distress, um, which is what they did. And then that ship saw us. So we got our position from his position worked out where we were, and then Captain Detmar was too far away really to be of any help. But he handed over to the other ships that were in the area, and we had one ship called the Gazerbi 2, the Gazerbi 2, that's right, and then another ship called the Great Nancy. And those two ships then came to our aid. And again, they were on the radio with us, asking different things. And one of the things they'd asked when I was on the radio, and they were saying, okay, well, they only had one lifeboat apiece because they were small ships, and said, we'll send a lifeboat over. How are you going to hoist the lifeboat up? I said, well, I, I don't know how to hoist the lifeboat up. <laughs> well, how are you going to get people into player. it? guitar <laughs> player. Yeah. <laughs> and they said, well, how are you going to get people into it? I, I, don't, I don't know. He said, well, they can't jump. They'll just be killed. It's too, too far to jump. You can't jump into the water and swim to the lifeboat. The storm's too wild. The currents are too strong. What are you going to do with our lifeboats? So, well, well, I guess we can't do anything. They said, well, then we can't help you. Oh, man. And they said, we can't come too close either because the storm is so bad and there's this, these incredibly strong currents in this area. A number of ships have gone down in this area. Um, the Waratah and there's, there's a few other quite famous ships have sunk in this exact area because it's so rough and the currents are so bad. Uh. Um, and they said, we'll just stand by next to you. Get your and ass over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, seriously, they can't just leave you. Sorry, can't help you. Yeah, so they said, at well, least we're, go we're and stay give as you close guys light or something. They'll stay as close as they can, but they need to be a safe distance away so they don't bang into us and tip us over and also endanger their own ship. But they said, in the meantime, the South African authorities are trying to organize a helicopter rescue. So oh. we waited for that. And, and in, in between... Um, we still had the remaining people in the Four Seasons Lounge whilst this little group of us were on the bridge. But the ship really felt like we were worried about it flipping over. So they were in the lounge, and it sounds like the ship is probably about like that. Like, yeah. And then it would kind of roll like back 20, a bit and tip like over. 15, 20 degrees, or how far? Yeah, that, you think? That, that sort of angle. I um, mean, I've. I've and I said, I, I said much earlier, I, I always take photographs and video and, and my wife does the same thing. And so we've got some amazing photographs and video footage of, of all of this. And in, in, a, in a couple of the shots and in, in some of the video footage, the, the angle is, it's hard to believe. It really, really is. It's hard to believe that it's that steep. Um, so did the, and, did the piano finally roll off the stage? Yes. Yeah. Into the drum kit. Just <laughs> broke all the drums and, and by one leg of the piano kind of buckled under it and it kind of just so it just collapsed and off the stage but it just lay there and nobody got injured no you didn't get near anyone and so we we then waited for for helicopter rescue and, and we didn't let anybody go down below but i i was going down below to go and check on where the water levels were as they were coming up and the last time that i went down again i had my camera with me and i went down one set of staircase. I hadn't even got to the crew area yet. And I could hear the water. And again, it, it, it's these little points that I remember of, of kind of shocking realization of, of, of the severity of our situation. And this was another one of them. And I could hear this water rushing in corridors. And I, and I was way above water line <laughs> normally. And carried on going down the staircase. I wanted to see where that water was so I could kind of assess 
uh, the, the, the risk to the passengers who were still in the Four Seasons Lounge. And I got my camera and I filmed that water and it was on, it was on D deck, which was for Dionysus in Greek. And I can remember filming, I've still got the footage and, you know, I don't know why I started narrating it, but I did. <laughs> You know, I'm filming this water and, and you can you can't see very well because there's just the emergency lights, but you can see the water shimmering and, and rushing from side to side. And you can hear it. And I'm saying, well, you know, this we're on D-Deck and I gave the time and the date. And I said, well, I, I guess we're going down and went back up. Now, to give us an idea, like how many decks was there, I guess, A, B, C, D. Now, was there E, F or, or lower or? They were lower, and then there were crew decks lower than that, and then the um, and then the engine room below that. So it meant that probably about five decks were now flooded. So went back up, and then then I went to go and check Mm-mm-mm. back into the lounge. We thought we need to get all the guests out of the lounge now because it's it's just it's just too risky, and I went back one more time. And went down the staircase that's right outside the lounge goes down into the restaurant which i'd mentioned earlier everyone was eating and they came out of there straight into the lounge i went down those stairs and i could see the water in the restaurant oh. so that's must be about seven decks deep now and that was another shocking sight. again you can't see properly you can just see this water little lights playing on it and there's tablecloths and bread rolls and flowers from the different flowers on the on the tables and bits of food and just debris just sloshing about this great body of water but suddenly you go over the port side as the ship righted and then crashing back onto the starboard side as it settled down again on the starboard side and it that is so it is such a frightening sight and it's it, it's funny how how shock you can feel it physically and i can remember i can remember being so shocked i could feel the shock in me thinking, oh my God, this is just below the, the, the lounge where we're all kind of hiding out from the storm. Yeah, anyway, and, you, so- and you mentioned this, but you, you, it's the realization now that there's, there's no hope for this ship. We're going no. down because the watertight doors, people that don't know, watertight doors are everywhere on the lower decks, but at some point, there's no watertight doors anywhere. So it, when it gets above that, there, you're, you, you're not stopping the water. You can close the fire screen doors, but that's not stopping the water. You're mm-hmm. absolutely right, Brad. That's absolutely right. And, and I, I knew then this, that there's nothing can stop this ship sinking. We just have to get these people off. So we got everybody out of the lounge and all onto the pool deck. So at least it was an open deck. But we knew that it'd be a bit scary for the guests. And it was still dark. But now we're heading towards dawn. And I'm not sure of the times now. But I think this must have been, we're still waiting for the helicopters. This must have been somewhere around 4 a.m. I'm guessing a bit, but something around that time. And just the first fingers of dawn started to come over the horizon. And we got everybody out onto the pool deck. But then it's quite frightening, the stark reality for the guests. And they can see this terrible angle that the ship's at, waves still pounding, this wind howling around them, spray. And, you know, and, and, and I've got some great photos and video of everybody just kind of just sitting on the pool deck, just looking and looking shell-shocked. Yeah. And... and Anyway, we're back on the bridge, and now we're just waiting for the helicopters to come. And eventually, helicopters do come. And it was, it was like out of a movie. And, and, and I've, I've got this video footage of, of them just flying. There's this sunrise coming behind them. There's this dark sky, but it's just lightning. And then the, as the sun comes, the sky is lightning. You've got this dark shape of the helicopters. And then this thin cable and a guy in a black wetsuit just hanging underneath his arms spread out wide stop himself spinning around in the wind and and they he's flying towards us there's a, several helicopters one of them with with a navy diver hanging out of it and we thought right now now here's here's the cavalry that this will all be great and they were hovering over the, the the forward deck and we could see from the bridge there's like like a big area there it's actually got a big h on it where you're supposed to land a helicopter if you have to i guess and they were trying to lower the guy onto that, but we, we still had these very, very strong winds. Now the light was coming quite fast now, and we could see pretty clearly now outside. And the helicopter's hovering up there. As 
the cable's dropping and the guy's hanging here, he's starting to swing in the wind and they're trying to lower him onto the deck. And the, as they lower him, the more he swings and the mm. until by the time he gets down to the deck area, he's swinging so fast and so far, he cannot get onto the deck. And they kept on trying. And I think then they tried on the aft deck. I didn't see that. And they were still trying it at, at, back on the fore deck again. And so I thought, well, let me go and see if I can try and help. And I left the bridge, went down and went to that fore deck area. And, and you can't walk on that deck because it's so steep and you'll just slide down into the water then. But I found some rope, tied it around my waist, tied it around the port side railings there. And Tra Tracy filmed me doing this. And it looks a bit hopeless, but, and I guess it was, but I mean, you've got to try. And I, mean, I, and I kind of going down the rope, my feet on the deck, almost like mountain climbing down that rope to the middle of this deck area and trying to see if I can catch the guy, but he can't get low enough to me. And then eventually we realized that the problem was there was a cable running from the top of the bridge right down to the bound and they put flags on it and lights and that sort of nonsense. And the, the, the helicopter guys were concerned that he was going to swing into that cable. They were sort of pointing to it, hanging out of the helicopter, and we were kind of communicating just with hand signals. So I thought, okay, fine, let's get that cable out of the way. So I got some more rope. And, and this is the bit that looks a bit pathetic when Tracy's videoed me doing this. And when I play the video back, I think, oh, God, <laughs> because I'm trying to swing this and throw the rope over this cable so I can pull it and try and break the cable. But I'm so hopeless, I can't even get it over the cable. The rope's thick, you know, it, it, just, it just didn't work at all. And then eventually, one of the, the helicopters, they pull the guy, the Navy diver, back up in there. One of the engineers from the helicopter, wherever they are, the winch engineer, hangs out over looking at me down below. And he's got a big pair of bolt cutters, and he's just showing me these bolt cutters. You know, I'm looking up, and, okay, you want me to cut the cable of the bolt cutters, right? I move out of the way. He just drops the bolt cutters from the helicopter. I slide down my rope, grab the bolt cutters, climb back up the rope. We had one of the other, not the entertainment, but actually the guy who managed the jewelry shop, <laughs> Ronan, was around. And I said to Ronan, listen, here's some bolt cutters. Can you climb onto the roof of the bridge and cut that cable? Oh, so he did. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it's not just the entertainers who were there, but I'll tell you the shoppies as well. And so Ronan was there. And I mean, that is a damn difficult job with the ship lurching around like that. But he made it, climbed up there. Every, it took him a long time. Everything is there. difficult right now. Folks, <laughs> we have the entertainment staff sa literally saving everyone's life on this ship. Doing, I can't even, I, I, I don't, I mean, I would like to say that I would try to be as helpful as I can but I don't know if I had, would, I don't know. You, you, I guess you don't know until you're put in that position, but I don't think I could repel down a ship that's sideways and say, Hey, okay. Thanks for the bolt cutters. Hey, climb on the bridge and cut. <laughs> no, I am like, honestly, I am nervous as hell just listening to this, knowing that obviously everything turned out. Okay. Cause we're talking to you, but it's just nerve wracking and just listening to it. I can't imagine <laughs> being there in that moment. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm probably talking too much and making this too long so i'll just quickly try and get to the end so so um now that the cable was cut the helicopter came a bit lower they tried to lower the navy diver again i still stayed out on my rope and as the navy diver came down grabbed him then we stood on the railing together i remember us on the railing holding on the railing and the one navy diver he had like a, a knife or something i remember scratching his initials into the into the railing <laughs> and i was saying to him you, you you can't do that. And he said, no one will ever see it. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he was saying, this ship is going, there's nothing we can, and I still had this vague idea that, I don't know, a tug was suddenly going to come and tow us to safety. But anyway, and so he now, said- Did he give you the knife so you could carve your initiative? <laughs> <laughs> no. and, and so then he said, look, what we're going to try and do, we can see from the air, there's too many people still on board. We think we'll lose people today. This is just, there's just not enough time. So he said, what we're going to try and do is have one helicopter hover over the bow and one over the stern simultaneously. It's very dangerous because they're quite close together because the ship's quite small and the winds are so strong. But if we don't do that, it's not going to work. We'll try and split the remaining people in half. 
we had we had one zodiac on board you know those rigid inflatable boats and the one navy diver gary gary schular said i'll go and launch that boat and he took julian the magician with him and in they went to go and launch that boat so that Gary would be controlling it and Julian would be in the boat. And they said, what we'll do is we're going to pick up people as the ship sinks. We'll try and pick them up out of the water and quickly drive them out to the waiting lifeboats from the other couple of rescue ships. And then if anybody falls out of the helicopter harness, we'll be there to pick them up as soon as possible. So they said, we're going to send the other Navy diver to the stern, a guy called um, Paul Wiley. He'll do the aft rescue. And they said, can you run the forward rescue station? We'll teach you how to do a helicopter airlift. So I said, okay. Um, Is that so anything he... like learning <laughs> chords for my guitar? <laughs> 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 so, I mean, they, they showed me how to do it. And they said, look, you're going to put the harness on. They said, it's easier if you do one person at a time, but we cannot wait that long. You're going to have to, we're going to have to use a double harness. So you're going to have to put the harness around. And basically, it's just a the thin cable comes down, and then the harness is like a loop like that. And you just got to put people's arms through it and put it around underneath their arms up there. And, and they said to me, make sure it's up tight under their arms and high up in their back. Because as it lifts them off, if it's too low in the back, it'll lift their feet off, and their head will go down, and they'll fall out, and you'll just kill them. So you need to make no sure pressure, it's No pressure. High. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the difficulty was when you, I had the first person in trying to keep it up there and keep it right and then get the next person in line. But the whole time, the ship is such a steep angle. People are slipping down the deck. And in actual fact, um, I, I, I dropped two elderly ladies and they slid down the deck kind of on their stomachs. And I had to stop the operation while I quickly shimmied down my rope, grabbed them. And then they, they just clung on to me. They couldn't pull themselves up. And I wasn't strong enough to pull the three of us. I just didn't have it. But so again, Ronan, the shopkeeper, was there, and, and one of the other entertainers, and I forget who now, managed to sort of pull the three of us up. We got back up in there, right? And then I got some more rope, and I tied a rope from one kind of a bulkhead out to the railing, so it was a bit of a safety rope. And then we, Tracy then organized the passengers, and she said to them, as you're walking out there, keep one hand on the railing and one hand on this little safety rope that Moss has got up, and it kind of went the railings this way and the safety rope there, and where they met, that's where I was. And so we had a little bit of protection for people. And people, were, and I'm glad we did that because I think we saved a lot of people falling down like that. So that's what we were going to do. They gave me the training. I did my first lift. We tested it with, with two of the um, dancers and put them in there. And Tracy's got video footage of me putting them into the harness and then them, get, them getting hoiked off. And you hear them squeal as they get lifted <laughs> off. It, it's scary. And of boom, course. they went off into the helicopter successful. Okay, and they said, right, you're in charge, you run this rescue station. So then we split the remaining people more or less in half. So you know, I took about half, I suppose about 114 people, something like that, in the bow and the rest to the stern with Paul Wiley, the Navy diver. And then Tracy and I just ran that helicopter airlift. And she just kept feeding people out to me. And I just kept putting two in a harness, up there would go. Each helicopter only took 12 people. Then they had to fly to the shore, which was several miles away. I can't remember the distance now, but I think it was around 12 miles, 12 nautical miles. But we had, I think there was something around, I think it was five helicopters in total. So they just, they tried to just keep it shuttling and just, and I just kept on just people as fast as I could rescue them. We just rescue them. My hands were getting quite messed because I was hanging on the rope. You know, I've got delicate musicians' hands, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, eventually we kind of got them all out and then that helicopter flew away and we still had people left and the helicopters didn't come back and we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting and we're thinking has there been some miscommunication do they think they've got everybody and, and how many people few, how many people are left we didn't know time? exactly but we thought you know less than 20 um and we sort of waited and waited and waited and the people were starting, well, what's, what's happening? And, and Tracy was dealing with that, kind of keeping that, that panic under control. And she's very good with doing that. And then a helicopter came back, finally. And we thought, oh, my goodness. As it turns out, now I know, they ran out of fuel. And they had to go and get fuel from somewhere else. Helicopter comes back. 
again, that sort of winch engineer hangs out. I'm waiting for him to lower the winch. They gave me a whole bunch of signals that I'd learned. I've forgotten what they were now, but I had to do all sorts of different signals that I learned like on the fly. And then he's leaning out there and he's giving me a new signal I haven't seen. He's going to me like this. He's just doing this, hanging out there. I'm like, what? And then eventually I figured he wants, that's counting. Uh, maybe he wants me to count everybody. So we did. So we counted everybody. So we had, and it turns out we had 12 passengers left, plus Tracy and me running the helicopter airlift. And we had one other entertainer, Robin. We left one of the magicians on the bridge. So there were 15 people now left on board. So then I gave them the signal. And then he, he, he said to me, nah, and started pointing to the back of the ship, you know, and saying, you know, you back. And he wanted me to go to the stern. And we were right there in the bow of these, and we were just saying, give me this. And he's going, no. And what they could see from the air, but we couldn't see it yet, is the ship was right over on its starboard side, but it, we hadn't seen it was gradually going down in the bow. And that's actually how the ship went down, was in the bow. And that's where we were. But it was starting to tip down in the bow now. And so they just wanted us to get to the back as fast as we could, but we couldn't really feel that. But anyway, I just thought, well, that, okay. look, I'm not going to argue. They can see something. So I said to these 12 people, we need to get the back. And they were saying, no, we're right here. There's helicopter bleed. You've saved everybody else. And you know, we, we, we got them going, got them to the, to the stern of the ship. And actually, Paul Wiley, the Navy diver, was still there. He would got all his people off already. He was just in his wetsuit, kind of just waiting. Was there anything else happening? And suddenly we appeared. And he was like, where did you come from? Carbon so we, his last name. Yeah. And right. So then very quickly, because he was so fast with the harness, we got those 12 people off. Boom done and then it was our turn and then putting the harness on me and the harness on tracy we got off and i knew what those passengers went through because as you get pulled off that deck it's it's a scary feeling and you're hanging over that deck and you think, oh, don't, don't break you don't want the cable to break or fall out and then they take you out over the water and start winching you up and it's very hard to get now, into now that. I, I gotta ask you because you videotaped everything did you have the camera rolling as you were being pulled up <laughs> no unfortunately not it's just too difficult you know, i had a big camera as well it was in it was in my backpack so were so you, were you the last people on board that was, that was no question. the last person on board was paul wiley the navy diver okay mm -hmm. Oh, but, and, but he I mean, wasn't ship, from the he wasn't from the ship. No, oh. no, no. And uh, and in fact, the, the last um, of the ship pass not passengers, but entertainers was um, was Robin, who was on the bridge. So Tracy and I went off double in the harness, and then Robin went up, and then Paul Wiley stayed a little bit longer, and then he went up, and then that was it. And then then we still had in the Zodiac, we still had Gary Schooler and Julian Butler, the the magician there and they actually had picked up a lot of people because uh, there's so many little stories but you know uh, uh, somebody did get dropped out of the helicopter harness did slip out of it um but into the water fortunately Ugh. um and they picked him up but also because it was getting towards the, the end it it, it 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 was it was pretty frightened i mean i i was feeling pretty tense towards the end actually and but people were jumping off the side of the ship then it was, people were getting so scared and they were picking people up then. So it's a good thing we had Gary and Julian in that Zodiac. So then we flew over that Zodiac to go and pick up those two because those were actually the very last two to, to be rescued. But the downdraft was so heavy, we couldn't get them properly. And they came back to get them in, the, in a second helicopter. Then we flew back to the shore. I got some great video footage. I pulled it out of my backpack again of us going past the ship as, as it's there. And I mean, it just you can see from the air just how stricken that ship was. And then we got back to shore and you could see as we were flying over that it's such a room. It's called the wild coast, this area where, where we, where it sank. And there was a tiny little hotel resort called the Haven in an, in an area called the hole in the wall. And there's a huge rock with a big hole through it. It's called the hole in the wall on the wild coast. And they'd been putting all the people. Now the military had got there somehow. I don't know how they were already there. And they had people lined up in rows on the grass and we could see it as we were flying over they were trying to count everybody and, and when we landed there must have been radio communication in the helicopter with the guys there and they were saying right this is the last helicopter it's all over and the people knew that it was us who'd been rescuing them and it was really quite emotional because they all started singing please a jolly good fellow and 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 i actually had two video cameras and another one of the entertainers terry 
had that camera and filmed me getting off the helicopter. Oh my God. A and people are sort of all running up and, and they're kind of slapping on the back. And I remember someone coming up to me and saying, is it over? Is, is everybody off? And I, I said, yes, everybody's off. It's over. And I just started sobbing. I, I don't know why. I, I, I mean, I was absolutely fine. And, and I collapsed. I couldn't. I'm about up. to cry That's right now. They, 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 that put me on a stretcher. That to put me on a stretcher and take me and put a drip in me. I, I don't know what was wrong with me. Well, but the level of adrenaline. Well, for you're so adrenaline. long. I mean, yeah. you're talking about like it's it's it was more than twenty. It took longer than well, almost twenty four hours, didn't it? Yeah, I suppose from the time that the well, about eight p.m. at night, it all really kicked off, and we finally got off the ship around about eleven a.m. the next morning. And it felt really close at the end because I said, you know, it, it nosedives down, but it wasn't as close as we thought because the ship still lasted about 45 minutes from the t from when we got off. So it, not it felt a lot close, but it wasn't that close. Yeah, to me, that's 45 minutes is pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a lot closer than I ever would want to be to a ship going down. Oh. And wow! Sure but I mean, you know, ships going down, it, it, it's like it, it's like if there's any other kind of thing, you could fall off a bicycle or if there's a car accident or things like that. It it didn't even slightly put me off going on ships. I mean, that that was a very strange occurrence, and I've continued to trace in Iceland to, to do ships to this day, and I still absolutely love it. But boy, you know, I wouldn't want to go through exactly that scenario again. Now, now <laughs> let me let me ask: Did you have, or do you still have, a uh my well major then and mild now ptsd i mean no. does that did it ever bother you did you have dreams about it that i mean did you have nightmares for you know after that no Just... not really no no huh oh i mean that, it's uh, i guess if, if it might have been worse if, if we'd lost lives but you know fortunately we did manage to get everybody off we didn't know we had everybody off for several days and that was quite stressful as they were trying to piece the manifest together and who jumped off the ship and who was in the helicopters. And but eventually 571 people are all accounted for. We got everybody off. Okay. Okay. Moss. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left here. So, so you've rescued everyone. Nobody lost their life. Everyone's safe. What happens after that? What happened to the officers and the captain? Were they, were, were they prosecuted? Well, strangely enough, the, the, I had mentioned before that uh, all a lot of the press stories always say the captain got off on the first lifeboat, but he didn't. I actually did find him on board um, it was the third when we were on the bridge and we were, we were on the radio and talking with these different other ship captains and rescuers and asking for coordinates and all this sort of nonsense. And they were saying, well, you know, where is the captain? He said, we don't know where he is. And they said, well, you need to get him, go and find him and get him to come here because he will know what to do, you know, how to hoist up lifeboats and all that sort of stuff. So I said, look, I'll go and try and find him. And, and I knew that it, it wouldn't take long because most of the ship was flooded. So, and the only reason I was sure he was on board is because one of the other entertainment staff, Geraldine, had seen him getting off in one of the very early lifeboats and had asked him directly, Captain, are you getting off now? And I don't know if he felt ashamed or what. No, um, I'm just checking the lifeboat. And he got back on board. And then that lifeboat with all the other officers left. So he so, oh, so he was trying to leave. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I, I don't know what's in a person's head. Perhaps he was going to get back on board anyway. But when Geraldine asked him, he was getting into the lifeboat. And he stopped and he got back on board. So we knew he was on board. So I went to go and look for him went up and down the decks, went to the pool deck area. And as with most pool decks on ships, you've got kind of the pool and that decking area. And then you've got staircases that go up to sort of sun decks that kind of go around it. Often it's a jogging track and that sort of thing. And where that staircase goes up, it's kind of a, a darkened little hollow underneath there. That's where he was. And he was there with one of the other officers. I think it was the radio officer. Doing what? And they were kind of hiding there almost from everybody. But... This is why we still had everybody inside the, the Four Seasons Lounge, but they knew how dangerous it was. They wanted to be up on the deck. They had their life jackets on, and they were just sitting on there and smoking. And when I, when I found him, I said to him, you know, Captain, we've made radio contact. Can you come to the bridge? 
no necessary it's not necessary and he was just smoking and i said look can, can you come and help us gone. To, to 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 tell people what to do and i said also we were, at this stage we were launching the lifeboats i said it's completely dark we want to have flares um where are the flares and how do we work the flares can can you come and show us what to do with the flares and he just was smoking just saying not necessary not necessary and he just and he i could see from his face he was gone and i just never went back to him after that i just gave up on him and you know i i have i'm not sure what happened to him because i'm imagining that there he was an officer in white and he was quite a good looking guy and a you know typical sort of officer preying on all the females and and, and that sort of thing and it's it's not not the best side of, of of those older ships in those days and not like that now and but there he was on the bridge everything fine and suddenly the chief engineer comes to him and says what's happened we've got they, they had a one of the sea chest valves had fractured below the waterline all of us coming in they had done some repairs on some valves on the inside in the piping and the sewerage systems which you're not supposed to do at sea so they had those out which is why none of the safety valves could work. The sea chest burst, the water came in those pipes. The pipes went straight through the watertight doors and to a holding tank in the bow on the starboard side. That tank just filled up and then just started to back up. And then all of the drains and the toilets and the basins, the shower mm -hmm. drains, it just started to come up through. It was just unstoppable. And apparently, I only mean, you know in the inquiry afterwards that you know he loaded that all on the captain. And I think the captain just went, Oh my God. And, and obviously realized suddenly he was now the captain of a ship that was going to sink and that, that he, they couldn't stop it. They knew on the bridge then that it was unstoppable because these, because of these pipes and the valves that were open, the water the water, doors, made the no water tight doors weren't doing any good because it was going, or it was going through the water tight doors. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Brad. So, um, and, and I think in fairness to the captain, he just kind of, got crushed under the sudden weight of that huge responsibility for us as the people who were helping out uh we did it so incrementally first of all it's oh, i'm just picking up my acoustic guitar i entertain a few people until the lights come back on and then what's happening Moss? oh you start checking this out and then i go there and you know tracy goes here and julian does something over there and, and then just gradually we started to assume this responsibility so it didn't hit us like a big shock like it hit him and I just don't think he could cope. Now, now let me let me ask. <clears throat> um, you were the entertainment staff, a group of what five, six, or seven, eight of you, yeah. or something. Um, so, was there no other crew members? I mean, there had to have been a hundred or a couple hundred crew members. No other crew members assisted you guys. I mean, I, I'm sure they probably did helping people, you know, find their way and stuff, but. Just the eight of you, the band, took control and saved everybody on that ship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we did have some of the, the crew who were standing out at their lifeboat stations and did the, the actual lowering of the lifeboats because we, we didn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. They did that. And then you've got to have some crew went into the lifeboats as well. And I don't know how many numbers. I mean... It, it was just it was just all happening in the dark and when a lifeboat had a lot of people in it we just let it go let me go um, to to uh after this so i'm i'm pretty sure that you would probably be the biggest witness with all your videotaping and stuff did you go to trial did you have to i'm sure you ha would have to testify and tell yeah. the story for yeah. the inquiry and so they did have an international inquiry and they held that um, and they flew in marine investigators from around the world who yeah. is impartial as possible. And, and, and that investigation was quite um, uh, quite tense because the, they don't know who to believe. And I mean, they'd be firing questions at me and you, know, you say one thing and then they'll come at it from a different angle and then ask you a similar question. They say, ah, but in your notes, you said anything. Um, I'm not sure. But the evidence was so overwhelming. And Not you had videotape of, of it all, pretty much. Yeah, I've got videotape of it all, which they used in, in evidence. Plus, the other ships were talking about, oh, we, we were speaking with the entertainers, and we spoke with a guy called Moss and a guitarist and Lorraine. And um, 
so, so th nobody could dispute what had happened. So what the captain did was stuck to his guns and he said that he got off on a helicopter and went to shore to go and run things from there. And he said, and in fact, there's a video of him saying this shoreside whilst we're still on board rescuing the people um there he's was like, someone video they're with moss he, he'll take care of everything he, yeah. he's got it under control and they, they said to him but captain you're here on the shore and there's still people on board the ship um and and he said i gave the order to abandon abandon is for everybody some like to stay they can stay uh, wow what a I know he. So the, I, I know the, the, he lost his captain's card or whatever that is. Well, the, the result of the inquiry was the captain and four senior officers, or was it five? Anyway, the captain and four or five senior officers were found guilty of negligence, and that was that. That was the end of the inquiry. They all went back to Piraeus. We all went back to our lives, got onto other ships, and that captain got another ship and was captain of another ship. Oh my oh gosh. My God. Yeah. And I actually went That's to, wrong. Yeah. Tracy and I were, were on a ship in Piraeus and um, I went to go and visit a, a friend, worked at a pair of tiki lines. Helen went into that into that building. You can see it when you're in Piraeus port, you can see the bigger Peritiki building there. I mean Peritiki cruise lines doesn't exist anymore, but it did then a couple of years later. And went up the elevator, elevator doors open. I was going to go and see her. And standing right there in his uniform was Captain Yanis Avranas, our captain. And I just got such a shock seeing him there. And he always got a shock seeing me because there'd been a lot of press coverage. And I, I'd, I'd done a, a pile of interviews and different TV shows and stuff. And we got made out in the press as these big antagonists. But we weren't. I don't have any animosity towards the guy. You know, I, I feel he shirked his responsibilities. He should have done better. He should have stepped up. But you don't know how you're going to respond in a situation. You just don't know. And unfortunately, he just crumbled under it. And when I saw him on that pool deck, I realized he was just gone. So fine. OK. But when he's there, he just said, what are you doing here? And I said, I've come to visit Helen. And he just said, I have another ship. And he just pointed out the window. And although we had another ship, it was a kind of a bit of a sideways push. It was the ship that was being worked on. And, and I don't... I'm now surmising this is not fact, it's just what I'm thinking. I, I think perhaps the cruise line thought, well, they need to keep him on because they, if they were to fire him, it would be tantamount to admitting, well, then he'd done something wrong. And all along they said, and they still stuck to the guns, he did the best he could. And and everyone keeps on saying, but look, everybody got rescued. The rescue plan the captain put in place worked. Oh, yeah, but you freaking bad. left like you dirt brag. <laughs> Yeah. Well, hey, Moss, we're, we're about to run out of time, man. Thanks for coming on. What that, a ship story. That was Holy the moly. most incredible thing. I like I've said, I was honestly sweating through half of this. I just couldn't even imagine the horror and the craziness that you went through. We we yeah. definitely would love uh, if you're allowed to uh, photos and, um, you know, maybe videos or something like that, we'd love to put some of that on there. Um, if well, you, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a link. I've, I've got my photos and video on a, on a, on a Google drive. I'll, I'll send you a link. And if you want to use some of it, you can. And, and awesome. if you guys awesome. have all seen any sort of interviews or anything, if you type Oceanus, Moss comes out on most of those videos as he's being interviewed. Because <laughs> uh, I've now, you know, when I saw you, I was like, oh, yeah, I know, I, I know him. Uh, but it's just <laughs> from the, uh, the videos and interviews of if you, if anybody looks up Oceanus on YouTube or anywhere, uh, you will see footage of the ship sinking and you will see interviews with, with Moss uh, on there as well as, as the, you know, yeah. once, once the rescue and, happened. And there's a website, um, Oceanus Sinking. Dot com yeah I, was that it? Dot com. I actually yeah. created that with someone else because i used to get asked so much about what's this so i just put some photos and, and a bit of a story there and and at the very end once we'd been rescued and we, we were at shoreside we had to give a full statement and i actually put our statements on that website as well because it's fresh in your mind it was a few days later so those are there as well yeah if you want to, How, if you want to learn a little bit more about it let me ask one scott last, we've last scott thing. we've got to go Okay. okay. Well, 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 real quick, Go how ahead. long, how long did it take you? Cause you know, you finally got on, on, on land and everything was fine. And then 
and then the shock set in like how long did that take you you know a few days to catch back up with yourself after that or yeah we were mostly just really really exhausted um and then there, there was so much press and clamor around that we, we headed off to my parents place a little tiny town north of durban and kind of just laid low there hmm. wow. just one more yeah. question how long before you were back at sea uh i think it was probably a few months wow do yeah, people recognize you on different ships and cruise yeah and yeah i mean amazing enough so many of the cruise lines i work on um tracing out are in the safety videos that all the crew so often i go onto a new ship and they say you're the guy from the safety video <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow man. all right well hey again thanks so much is there is there anything you want to leave us with is there anything that you want to mention before we let you go and probably you know, just in in closing I'd, I'd say that it's amazing even having gone through that just how much i still love cruising i still think that that is it's the best way to travel and see the world it's just you cannot beat cruising and i still love doing it and maybe i'll maybe i'll see some of you out on a ship again someday that'd be great absolutely that'd be awesome well, hopefully not in the middle of the dark well it's yeah strange. not in the dark you know put hey, on well, a, a if there's somebody harness. i want to be with in the dark in that situation it's moss because yeah. he knows how to handle it you're yeah. right you're right you're right you're you'd be in good hands you'd be yeah. in high <laughs> all right well thank you so much moss we appreciate you coming on thank you very yeah, much thank, thank you so much, much. So much. pleasure thanks yes, ciao. Ciao, ciao. bye bye, bye. Uh, that is an amazing story. Oh it's just God. crazy and insane, but amazing. That's going to be a good one, I think. I can't even imagine that no. entire experience, the horror, the stress, the madness of, I mean, that's everybody's worst nightmare, right? Like your, your ship is going down. There's nothing that they can do. And by the time you're done, the, the ship is, 25 percent listed you know wow and and amazing those guys i mean they're 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 heroes i mean they're 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 really heroes and i mean i i think they'll probably deny that they're just like oh well i was put in the situation but hey that's what makes heroes you know they're not out there asking for it they're just in the situation and they do what it they do what it takes to get it done you know he's right there with captain sully and captain phillips and moss hill like he's right there that's I mean, yeah, he's yeah. right there. I mean, it, yeah. it's amazing what they, what he and they did. Um, and, and just a little side note here, nowadays, in order to get promoted to like one of these more senior roles, they, they go through like these trials, they have these simulators and they put people in simulation exercises to see how they react. They go through, uh, they do like psychological evaluations. They do all these things to see how they, they, how think. much stress you can handle. Yeah, how much stress you can handle and what do they think that these people are capable of, of managing that? Because that's really what you you are testing these people for is like the worst case scenario. You know, these you have all these people lives in your hands and these ships are huge now, like thousands and thousands of crew and guests. Um, so you really need people that can raise to that challenge and not like what happened to that, that poor captain. Yeah, can you imagine the ship the size of like the uh, oasis. oasis or something with a 20 degree list. I oh. mean, if you're up that high, oh my 15, God. 20 degree the, list, well, I mean, you're looking into the, you're looking straight yeah. down the ocean. Well, the, yeah. the ships now, the holes are like this, but you yeah. know, back then they were more like that. So if that, if that oasis is so top heavy, I, I mean, I, I don't know, you would think it would yeah. just get so far and just fall over, but Gosh, but hopefully they thought about that and all the new ship engineering uh, yeah. in order to for that not to happen and knock on wood that we haven't had an, a, a, a case like that in, in quite yeah. a long time. My yeah. favorite part yeah. about this whole thing is okay, I gotta that go. he was recording the entire thing on his. Oh, did he? Oh, hold on a second. Oh, yeah. He was recording it <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I thought you meant the interview. Yeah, but that's pretty crazy. He was taking on his camera and it wasn't like a phone. It and then was I had camera. two cameras. She was recording me coming in on the airlift and I'm like, yeah. Yeah, you guys okay. look up. I, I'm sure you've seen it, but if you look up Oceanus, he comes up a lot uh, yeah, uh, in any I sort bet. of documentary about all that stuff. He's front and center. As, as He's even on be. the Wikipedia page. Oh, is he? 
Yeah. 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 No, but I mean, he was the one that really made the difference, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyhow, I'd really wow. got to go. Crazy. Okay. Well, awesome. Hey, can you hang on for, for one minute? Okay. Um, just some minute. housekeeping stuff. Yeah. Um,